So I'll be co-sharing like I'll be co-sharing Yes, and I will be too much about her past research because it sounds like her talk is going to cover everything. Um, so without further ado, excited to do Selena. Thank you. Molly and Colleen and other students are involved in, in, uh, in your student group and inviting me to talk here. Uh, I'll preface my talk with saying that um, I'm a little bit long in the tooth and I've been retired now technically for six years and uh, we're Half time as a you know phase retirement for three years, and I know I'm retired, retired, working part time for the last three years. So I'm not doing a lot of really cutting edge research because uh, my body's worn out. And putting this talk together made me realize why I'm so tired. Because <laughs> um, uh, Molly had written like, well, talk about a little bit some of the highlights of what you've done over the years. So I tried to figure out, well, what am I going to talk about? So. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to try to put this all in context. My life, and, and also the other thing that Molly had written was uh, some perspective on the decline of coral reefs, which uh, sadly I have witnessed in my life. And um, the photograph I used here was taken back in the 80s from Belize. A lot of people here have been to Belize, and there was coral everywhere, there were fish, a lot of fish back then. And, um, and so I chose for the focus of my research um, to, to really go into more of the reproductive ecology, different aspects that I've done, because I think, um, as I'll say in a minute, I, I, I've been a generalist. I've, I've really studied a lot of different things, partly because I was soft money for many years. And when you're soft money, it's like whatever RFP comes out, request for a proposal, you jump at it. You know, <laughs> I've done seagrasses, I've done sediments, I've done corals, I've done well, lots of things. So uh, let's move on. Let's see if I get the slide direction right here. Which way should I point? So this is a backward sea level curve. I, I flipped it around just so because on the next axis, this is you know recent and this is going back in time. And people don't look at sea level very often. But um, as a coral reef geologist or ecologist, you really have to think about sea level. Um, and so here we are, and um, you know, sea level, this is going backwards in time. You can see over the last 450,000 years, sea level has been up and down and up and down. And the coral reefs that we work on now have only been around during here and here and here and here and here and, and here. So in between, sea level was way lower and you would have to be diving down to three, 400 feet to get to an environment where there were corals. And unfortunately, the way our continental and insular shelves are set up, once you start getting down to those depths, it's sort of steep. So uh, corals have been sort of refuges hanging in there during these long periods of time. We don't really know very much about reef growth during these periods of time, except for maybe a few places in the world where um, land has been uplifted, like in Curacao. So you have older reefs that are now mountaintops because they were old reefs that got you know, tectonically lifted up. The reason I want to point this out is because humans have only been, um, you know, the Homo sapiens someplace around here maybe, and, um, and then uh, agriculture sort of someplace in here, you know, the, this is the last big ice age, and uh, this is a, uh, someplace around here is when agriculture uh, was started. So we've, as a species, only been around doing things for not so long. Um, but this is what has happened during this time. Um, so 10,000 years ago, we see it's estimated that there were maybe 5 million human beings, half of New York City, third of New York City, on the whole world. And um, so around here is when sea level rise after the last ice age start coming up over the insular shells and we start getting the, our modern reefs building. And, and a lot of times they built up over old relic platforms. So it wasn't like they were starting from scratch. Sometimes there were old fossil reefs from higher stands of sea level and then the corals, they were high and dry and land and then they got flooded and new corals start growing. This is also about the time when agriculture was started by humans. And so, and we had migrated, you know, out of Africa, started way before that, someplace over here. Um, so now we're pretty much in, in all continents, except for Antarctica, but we're in the Americas. Uh, we're we're um, all over Europe and Africa and Asia. Um, agriculture started in the Fertile Crescent. Um, still not very many people, not very many people, and this is a log scale birth of Christ. Still, oh, maybe we're, now we're up to 250 million people because with more food, more people, people survive. Uh, I don't know what the green dots mean. They were just on the graph when I stole it. Um, <laughs> but I have superimposed on all of this me. These little red dots are different aspects of my life. So um, I was, and this is very compressed here, so I couldn't, the dots are cover a lot of area. But I was born in 1946, um, and there were maybe a little over two billion people, two and a half billion people on Earth. and. Um, Coral reefs probably were in reasonable shape back then because we had just started our bloom of, of uh, spe as a species and maybe we hadn't really quite overfished too much and, and maybe there was already pollution on the reefs and sediments and stuff like that, but we as scientists didn't know it, okay? Because there wasn't even scuba diving back here. Okay, my first dive, 1964, as a 18-year-old taking Peter Glenn's 
coral reef ecology course one summer. I was shelf lime advisor. Go to the, do something different this summer. And this is where I changed from being a chemistry major to a marine biology major. And but I didn't. I mean, I saw coral reefs and mangroves and seagrass beds, and it was all like wonderful and brand new. And um, and I didn't know anything about it. And so, but I switched my career and went off and did my master's and my PhD. And in 1982, I wrote my for got my first NSF grant um, to start working on Caribbean coral reproduction. Um, the whole time I've been alive and trying to do my coral reef research and learning about reefs, because I can tell you, there wasn't very much literature to read back there. There was um, this one big fat book by Hedgepath that had a, a chapter about coral reefs. And if you read that, and, and um, Stoddard's chapter and a few things, you knew everything there was to know about coral reefs. And everything there was to know about corals was in um, Libby Hyman's treatise on invertebrate paleontology, the, the, the one volume on Nidaria. So, you know, that's the literature base. Uh, and it's greatly expanded. So putting this into context, so I put Gardner's very famous graph here, looking at decline of coral cover. So when I went diving back here in 64, there was a lot of coral around, a lot of fishes. We saw gigantic barracudas and gigantic green eels, and there was coral and lobsters everywhere and things like that. Um, and um, so this is all the data that Gardner was able to put together, you can show that someplace in here things started to decline. Um, and 1981 was the, uh, the, the big, one of the big International Coral Reef Symposium was one in the Philippines. And it was the first time that, um, that man was part of the equation. They actually called it the reef in man was the subtitle for, for the international conference. Okay, so in the Philippines, of course, a lot of overfishing, very high population density way back then uh, compared to the Caribbean. But we were sort of a little bit in la-la land in, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, things were starting to go down, but there weren't very many people working down there. There weren't very many marine labs. There was Jamaica and La Parguera and Carmabi. I think those were the only labs that I could think of way back then. Really no place to work in the Florida Keys. There was the old Carnegie lab that was there in the 30s, things like that. But um, so, and scuba diving was still a new new activity. There wasn't even very many formal marine biology programs that you could go to school in. Anyway, um, so I started my reproduction work here in the early 80s. And, um, and a lot of what I'm gonna tell you about is a, a flying over it at a 30,000 foot level, because I don't have time to do a lot of details here. So I'm gonna try to give you a gist of how my career developed. Um, all along a background of doubling and tripling human population and decline, decline, decline of the coral reefs. I can tell you right now that if the coral reefs looked here, what they look like today, I would not have done this career. I could not have done the work that I've been able to do. The animals to work with would not have been there. I mean, it's sort of sad. Anyway, not to be depressing, <laughs> here we go. So um, where did I start? So when I went to um, Scripps, I worked on Gorgonians, and then I went to uh, Puerto Rico for a while, and then I ended up in Rhode Island because of my first husband. And after working for a year doing consulting work, I started working at the university as a technician, and I really wanted to go back to graduate school. And I discovered that right off the dock, there was this little coral called Estrangedanae back then, now it's Poculata, that existed with and without symbionts, side by side on the same piece of rock. And um, I was, became interested in the whole thing, the facultative symbiosis, and uh, why don't these corals have zooxanthellae, and why, what are these guys uh, getting from it, et cetera. So um, I developed my dissertation uh, based on the fact that these corals existed, and that I didn't want to try to get try to figure out how to get funding to go to the Caribbean and things like that, where I was more familiar with. Um, and so I did this study that combined um, the reproductive, uh, re reproduction, nutrition, and symbiosis of those in belly. So it was a five chapter dissertation. Um, uh, probably most of it was all on this nutrition. I was interested in the, in the nutritional interactions between the zoosanthelli and the coral. 
But, you know, we didn't know anything about corals, and we didn't know very much about coral reproduction back then. It was, if it wasn't in Libby Hyman, and it wasn't in the Great Barrier Reef Expedition, that's pretty much what we knew. Um, and, and a lot of what was in the Great Barrier Reef Expedition was incorrect. Um, not because they, they didn't find gametes, because they were there and they took their sampling erratically. So what actually they learned, what they published in the 1932-33 Barrier Reef Expedition reports was that corals don't really reproduce sexually. They, and, and there are papers, a paper by Bach um, at, at all that just said that most corals reproduce asexually by fragmentation and that only the brooding corals reproduce um, uh, asexually or you know by, by brooding sexually and if you didn't put a coral in a bucket of water and get larvae well then it didn't reproduce sexually. I mean that's sort of the I mean that's abbreviated but that's sort of the mentality. So my first chore was to figure out when do these when does a stranger get its osindeli? How does it get them? So I got into digging into the reproductive um, biology because I thought well they, they must planulate because all corals planulate according to the books. And so do they come out of the coral with their with their zosindeli or not. And so when I did all the um, histology and everything else, and one day in the lab, I'm doing one of my nutrition experiments and the coral starts spawning on me. And I was like, whoa, what are these guys doing? And so I had males, I had females, um, and I mixed them all together and I dropped everything I was doing and spent two nights in the microscope there trying to take photographs of every different embryonic stage and things like that. I think it's one of the first papers that actually described all the embryonic stages of a coral, which are very textbook, you know, one cell, two cell, four cell, eight cell, blastula, gastrula, little planula. And I never got past the planula stage. And But what I did discover is that they did not have zosindeli in them, and that were, they were broadcast spawners. And then that, um, so these, the, the symbiosis was facultative and they acquired it in the field somehow. I didn't really get into that. Rhode Island is really cold water. And I discovered I did not like diving in cold water, so I pretty much stuck to my laboratory experiments uh, and had other people collect the corals for me in the wintertime. But um, the, the fortuitous thing about it is at the same time that I uh, published um, the data about these corals um, spawning was just when in Australia, students were starting to go out and look for um, spawning behavior of corals. They saw my paper, and they were like, well, maybe our corals go spawning. And they had large groups of students at James Cook. So they went out there and they were going out diving and they observed the first big mass spawning. There was a paper published in Science 1984 where they published about the mass spawning of corals on the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, I had heard about their work. So I was like, ah, I wonder what's happening in the Caribbean. And I finished and so I started getting interested. Well, let me find out what the Caribbean corals are doing. So what, you know, what do I do next? I finished my my PhD, I got to do something um, for my next trip. So one of the things I, I need to say is that there are some people that pick a theme and stick with it their whole life and really, you know, fill in and they get all the dots filled in, they get the whole puzzle solved. And, and unfortunately, I've been very um, dilettante and, and, and uh, uh, very generic about things. I've, I've worked on way too many things during my life and um, I'm pretty much going to just talk about this, the reproductive part, and, and a little bit down here about this. Um, but luckily, I had excellent training between Scripps and Rhode Island. I had very excellent training, and I could learn a lot of things and, and just get interested in a lot of things. And so that's how I sort of made my career. I would necessarily recommend that for a lot of people. About half of what I'm going to show you today has, has not been published. So I started out the old-fashioned way histology, tons of histology to figure out what the corals were doing in the Caribbean. Um, and, and I published a paper in 1986 that summarized about 12 different species. Um, and so I'm gonna present some of that because probably you, some of you may not be familiar with a lot of this older work. But one of the first things I did was classify corals as either broadcasters or brooders. I'm not the first one to say that, but, but I, I was able to show which species fell into which category in the Caribbean. Most of them were of the major reef builders for the broadcast spawners. Um, but some of the most interesting one are these little brooders. Those are the ones we find a lot of recruits everywhere. So I'm gonna just show you one little bit of work uh, from the um, brooder story. So I worked with this little coral, Fabia frigum. It's an incidental coral. It's like a little weed. 
grows in, in harsh environments, it's all over the place, it's cute, and, and it's a planulator. And very little work had been done with planulators at that time. And so the first thing I did was, again, do a lot of histology. And because I knew it was a brooder, I took a lot of samples. And so um, I, and we knew that some of the Pacific corals, like Casoporos buticus, were uh, rooted on a uh, release planula on a lunar cycle. So I sampled over the lunar cycle, described the, the cycles of gametogenesis, was able to tie this is actual planulation in the field where we had all these colonies in little chambers and went out every day diving and looked and see how many planulae were allowed. We did it in the lab. Um, and then this correlates very well with the timing of the ova and spermary maturation. So the timing of planulation here is controlled not by the moon so much, but by the gametogenic cycle by when the gametes are ready to be released. So how that's um, affected. I had a student more recently, uh, Kenny Hoadley, who went on to do his PhD with Mark, uh, 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 um, can't remember his right now, but anyway, so, Mark, uh, so Kenny did for his master's thesis, he looked at some of the, um, some of the uh, different clock um, mechanism things to try to see if he could sort out what was triggering this. There's still an awful lot to be done to try to understand these planulation things. Um, I then moved more into the, the broadcasting species because these are the, the ones that really make up the reef. And these are animals that have usually annual cycles of reproduction where they spit their gametes into the water column. The, the larvae uh, develop in the water column and then settle. They form tiny, tiny little larvae, uh, little polyps that take maybe years to decades before we can even see them grow into very large corals. These are the more the K-selected type of species that are the major reef builders. And so I figured they were like more important ecologically. Um, and again, tons of histology, lots of sampling over a couple of years trying to define the cycles. Um, and I guess the, you know, the terminus of, of a reproductive cycle is when you actually produce your babies. Um, and so uh, the histology led me to identify times a year when the spawning was going to happen. And again, if you look at the time axis here, this is by 83, um, 84. So we knew from Australia that they were um, starting to spawn during the summer periods or during the height of the season. So I started out with two friends, three flashlights, and uh, trying to go out every night to see, or and then we went very so exhausted, we went out every other night. As far as our little 20 boat with wood boat with 25 horsepower motor could take us in La Paguera to get out to the reefs and we we go sit there in the boat until it got dark, and then we jump in the water, and then when we ran out of lighter air, we came home. Um, and that was it. Uh, that's all I could afford back then. Um, but uh, years later, we were in the Bahamas on doing something totally different, and we had some, some of my students were out there, and they saw the real spawning. So that sort of gave us a clue as to when to look. So along came, from then, once we knew what to do, and, and, the, and the better the, the time and night when it was happening, um, and I had more resources over the years in Miami at that point, um, I was able to develop a program around looking at the spawning and, and working with, I wasn't interested so much in the timing of spawning, but with what happens after the spawning. So we, we learned, we developed methods to collect all the gametes, um, we bring them onto the boats and fertilize them, and then we, we learned, it took years to really get this down, how to culture the larvae all the way to get them to settle, we did settlement in the laboratory experiments. Um, we settled them on settlement tiles and then put them back out in the field for looking at post-settlement survivorship uh, by, by re relocating and bringing them back, examining again. Uh, we fertilize them. Uh, we sometimes we try to reseed them directly onto dead substrate, things like that. So by developing this system, which was took a lot of work, um, we were able to. Uh, develop basically the kind of research that I was able to do for the following 10, 15 years. I did spawning work pretty much 25 years, 25 summers, and it's exhausting. And every summer I'd say, I don't wanna do this again. Why am I doing this? And then next summer we'd be out there doing it again until the last time, 2009, that's it. I said, okay, I retire. So, um, so disclaimer, uh, Montastria, Fabulata and Angularis are now Orbicella. You know that they changed the genus on me. But all my publications and older slides have Montastriatum, so for the purpose of this talk, they're gonna be Montastriatum. 
So Montasia fabulata spawning, uh, some spawn. Uh, here are these cups, we took them back to the boat, we mix things together, um, put them in big buckets, make all the spawn, put them in coolers, raise them. Here's a little spat, a couple weeks old, of, uh, that's acquired zozantheli, a little palmata, an older palmata. Um, so, you know, it, it took a lot of work setting up field laboratories down in the Keys. Uh, this is 2004 when we had four hurricanes and had to keep closing down and opening up things. Um, we didn't have really plenty of seawater, so it was, it was a marathon to get this done. Um, but what, we, what I started trying to work on was all the steps in, in the recruitment process, because that's what's important in terms of the ecology of the corals, you know, not that you spawn, or what your embryogenesis is, is you know, what comes out of that? What is the recruitment? So I'm gonna give you a little hops and skips uh, on some of these different processes. So once you spawn, you have this uh, larval supply. Um, it's gonna spend various amounts of times in the, in the plankton. How long does that take? Uh, when, what happens to them when they're up there? Uh, how do they know when to come down to the bottom? How do they know where to settle? Um, and what happens after that? What determines their survivorship? So, oh, I keep forgetting I have this here. Okay, so, um, so basically I'm looking at the steps in that lead up to some kind of coral recruitment. So I'll, I'm gonna go through these topics more or less. Um, so um, one of the first things I tackled was looking at the the whole process of dispersal. There was a lot of issue in, in reef connectivity. So if, you, if you're doing NPAs, where do you put them? Um, how far are, are reefs are gonna seed each other or is everything self-seeding? There were some papers back then, I had some very strong arguments with some very well-known people about whether reefs self-seed or out-seed. And I won't mention any names, but I think John knows who some of them are. Um, anyway, so I was, and, and, and this particular fellow was like everything self seeds and it's all within a uh, hundred yards or so from where they're spawned. And this was based on a paper done by Samarco, the, the helix experiment, which was totally wrong. But anyway, so <laughs> we argued at this at a workshop and I said, okay, we're, we're gonna look at this. So here's sort of basically a model. So here you have a reef and here's a big patch of coral spawning. And uh, I think what people that don't do a lot of this work that don't stay out there for a long period of time don't realize is how much water flow there is out there. Water moves. And if you leave a syringe or a plastic bag, gone, it's gone in minutes. So this is sort of a conceptual model that if here's a patch of spawn and things are developing and they're moving, where is the spawn? Where are the larvae going to be on a reef after uh, several days? Because then you can model all of this. Um, not me, but other people. So how long can the larvae be treated as passive particles? So my, my first question was, um, what the eggs float, um, and at some point they have to swim, and then at some point they have to go down. So I was trying to break, I'm not gonna go through all the details on all of these things, I don't have time. So the first thing we had to do is figure out, well, how do we know, how, come up with a method for looking at their, at their floatiness and how that changes with age. So we came up with this little method of using a graduated pipette and a stopwatch, and we'd pick up one larva at a time and time the ascent rate um, and plot it over time. So when they're freshly spawned, they have uh, an ascent rate of so many millimeters per second, and as they age, one of the things that they do, these things are 75% or higher lipid when they're spawned. And that's what they live off of. So the whole, they're not feeding or anything. They're just burning up all of this lipid and they become less buoyant over time. But they're still embryos and they're still not swimming. Okay, so their position in the water column is gonna to be totally passive wherever the current's picking. Um, and so this is a curve for, for Montastra fabulata from whichever year this was. Um, and we, we did it other years with uh, Annularis and Cavernosa. And here's several different species. Um, this is, uh, oh, it doesn't show up. This is Cavernosa. Dense eggs, hardly any ascent rate at all. They almost sink. And different species had different time courses. Um, and basically, let's see, this is, let's see if I can point at this. I'm not sure if it'll work here. Little video. Well, it worked, I didn't test it here. Anyway, that was a little video, little larvae swimming. 
maybe it's just being slow. Um, so I'm sorry, apparently the videos are not going to work. Um, anyway, so the the larvae swim around like mad. Finally, eventually, um, and but they're still pretty floaty. So we start working at uh, when do they learn how to swim downwards, or what are the time course of their learning how to explore for the bottom. So we came up with this other experimental method where we had water columns with embryos in them. In the beginning, they're all here at the top, and then we would examine them several times a day and count how many larvae were each in different depth zones. Um, and we had them on shaker tables, and we looked at the, um, did dye studies to make sure that the, um, that the motion wasn't sinking things to make sure for that. And what you see is that um, in the early days, most of the larvae are towards the top. Um, and then, and this was early morning, so after a dark night. Um, and th so they're pretty much in the surface. And then as they age, they start to end up being in the bottom segment. So they both become less buoyant because they use up the lipids. They learn to swim, or they develop the ability to swim. I shouldn't say they learn. But anyway, they, they develop the ability to swim, but they're still not sinking. And then at some point, they're, they're, they become uh, ne negatively phototoxic, and they tend to go down at night. Um, and we can see that in, in this uh, graph with larval age. And this, these are all the uh, diol changes. Just focus here on the dark AM. So at the end of the night, you can see that more and more of the larvae are in the bottom section. And that's when they start, um, so th basically this summarizes, uh, days one to four, no significant downward swimming, day five, downward swimming at night, day but day five, they still go up, and day, down six, on, afterwards, they're just down. And, they, and they're looking for where to settle. And I don't know if this video is gonna work either, probably not. Oops, that was not a good thing to do. Okay, so this shows them swimming around, crawling around. So then they start swimming around and they, they actively explore. So these, these little critters, they may not look like much, but they have little programs in there that says, I like this, I don't like that. Um, we've all read about how much they love crustose coral and algae and how important that is for settlement cubes. And when we use little chips of algae, you can see them, they're tucking in here. Very few of them will actually settle on the CCA, but they will settle underneath it, and all these little uh, nooks and crannies. Um, and so the next question I started, well, like, where do they settle, and what determines whether they settle in a good place or not? Um, so we did um, a lot of choice experiments with larvae. Uh, this is work we did with, with Maggie Noog, and she was a postdoc in my lab, and she had lots of different types of crustose corallins, and we're trying to look for, uh, here's, a cropper palmata and Montaster carinosa, and looking to see whether there were some species that were uh, preferred versus not. Uh, we did all like little six well plates and lots of replicates and little chips. And then we looked at whether they s settled on the upper surface on the, on the bottom. And they almost always surf uh, settled on the underside of the chip, not on the live alga. Um, we compared different species, brooders versus broadcasters. Um, so the brooders here are the, the red and blue columns versus the green and yellow when we had them uh, for, for spawning species. And you can see that they don't necessarily like the same coral and algae. Could you, um, the CCA type, just like the type of calcium carbonate that they're settling on? Or different species of, of algae of that algae have different, that so okay. these yeah, algae okay. produce supposedly chemical cues mm -hmm. that are attractive. People have done extracts, like methanol extracts and different types of extracts and things like that. And so there's something that is produced by the crustose coral that they secrete that actually induces settlement. That the, all the steps in this have not been. There's a lot of work to be done out there, and we tried around the edges to to look at this, but um, never really was successful to get anything that we're really happy with. So the other thing we were worried about is well, how long does each species take? So you're a passive particle in the beginning, you're, you're floating, you can't swim down. How long do you stay like, when do you finally get down to business and you know, find a home? So these are these time course experiments, same methods, little six well plays, put little um, things in there, look at them every day under the microscope. You can see here's Fabio Fregum, uh, first day, right away, right off the bat, they're ready to settle. Um, some of the other species uh, of, of um, Spawners, it takes them longer. Uh, Montastian and uh, Palmata, 
Palmata was the longest. It took six to eight days before it was really ready to settle. Um, Carinosa was ready to settle even the first day we tried it, two days, it was ready, ready. So those things, different species of corals, their larvae have different rates of development, and they're gonna be available for more dispersal or not, depending on all of this dynamics. Um, and so to summarize this, um, the way you need to think about it is that um, in the beginning, you're gonna have a period of no settlement because the, the embryos and the early larvae are not capable of attaching to anything. And so wherever the currents take them during that time, those reefs are gonna be bypassed if, if, they're not, um, if they're too close to the origin reef. And it depends on what the currents are doing, if currents are reversing, things of that kind. Um, and then finally, you're gonna enter, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, you're gonna enter a period where now the large larvae are capable of settling. And so they may be in the water column for many days when there's nothing there to settle on, no cues, and they may be lost. Um, and this period of time, we, we were able to keep Montastria pavulata for 30 days and still have them competent to settle. So there's a lot of capability for dispersal. The question is, what is the survivorship going to be of the larvae in the water column at that long time? And you know, the fewer corals spawning, the less potential for dispersal there's going to be. So I mean, right now, I think it's pretty bad. So one of the things that came along um, on the way was uh, I started collaborating. Well, actually, it was an accident down in Miami. Somebody got a fluorescent microscope. And, um, and, and uh, Mike Schmott, he was looking at these fluorescent goldfish. And, uh, and so we said, look, hmm, these, these corals are supposed to do that. Can I look at one of these under the scope? So here's one, one tastrous spat under a regular light microscope. You can barely pick out the darn things. You need to spend hours. But you put them under a fluorescent scope, and they shine out like little light bulbs. And this is um, Fabulata, and these are Carinosa, and this is an Agrisia. So you can actually, by the fluorescence patterns, you can distinguish these things. So there's a lot that can be done with the fluorescent microscopes. Um, and so this opened up a whole other approach of looking at the settlement, post-settlement side of things. So we would take settlement plates and put them out there and condition them for months on the, on the reef. Um, they would get grazed. They would sort of look like the background. We had to look hard to find them. Um, and then we'd collect our spawn, raise the spawn, settlement on the plates, and, um, and look at, count the spat in the microscope. And one of the first things we noticed is that uh, statistically, the spat seemed to aggregate. And so I figured there's, there's some kind of cues here on these plates. We don't know what it is, but they seem to, they're either aggregating with each other or with some substrate cue on the plate. So um, the other thing we discovered with our early experiments done very crudely was that they settled on the um, undersides of the plates. The side of the plate that was facing down had substrate cues that were more attractive to the larvae than what was on the upper plates. And I tested this by taking plates, cutting them in half. And so I had upper side and lower side. And I take one piece of the plate and put it upside down. And they would still settle on the side of the plate that had been conditioned face down. So it wasn't the orientation of the plate. It was the condition factor of the plate or something that they like. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Corals grow out in the open on the top of the reef. They don't grow you know, down inside the interstices of the reef. So it didn't make any sense. But we, and we could also tell by looking at the community structure of these plates that there seems to be some cues that they, they didn't settle on the plates in proportion to the, the cover of whatever the organisms were there. Um, so um, conclusions, let's see. Substrate cues important to induce coral larvae to settle. The substrate orientation was important to palmata. So those we found that they really did like the upper surface, at least in Florida, but as I'll show you in a minute, not in, in um, Puerto Rico. Um, the crustless corallines were, seemed to be important for providing this cue, but you know, it, it doesn't, there was still a lot of complexity there about what's determining where these things settle. So um, I had a chance to work in Puerto Rico and I designed an experiment that was sort of more statistically rigorous trying to get at this. So we chose three different sites, um, an inshore site, Pelotas, which is way in here someplace, um, a midshore reef, Tudo Monte, and then way out at the buoy, which is way offshore. Um, and we conditioned plates at each of these three sites, and in the two, uh, two inshore sites, we had two different depths. And so we had five different types of plates, and I randomly 
put them on skewers in three different aquaria, and they were arranged so that, so you have, this is a plate from one side, you have a top and a bottom, and here's a plate from the next side, you have a top and a bottom, and here's the plate from the next side, top and bottom. They're all mixed up, right? Um, and when you look at it, no matter, even though there's just this narrow gap between these two plates, this is a top, this is a bottom, they settled on the bottom, not on the top. So this top versus bottom is really, really strong. Um, here's how the total sediment went. They really preferred the offshore site. Whatever was growing on the offshore tiles um, attracted more larvae to settle on them than the more inshore sites. Um, and um, again, each of these, for each site and depth, the, the, um, the bottoms had more larvae on them than the tops, every single case. So there's something really, something happening on the bottoms of those plates that's, that's more attractive to the larvae than in the other sites. Um, so then we took these plates and we put them under grids and we characterized the percent cover of all the encrusting organisms for the tops and the bottoms. Um, for the three different sites, and here's what it looks like. It's like a mess. Um, so if you do a multivariate analysis on it, you can see that statistically the, the tops are the, the open symbols, dark symbols are the, they're, they're statistically different, the, the overall community structure. Um, here's the three sites. Um, this is for the, um, the tops. So two of the sites, the blue site and the um, these were different from each other, but it didn't make a difference because most of the larvae all settled here. And the bottoms of these three sites came out to be quite different from each other. And again, the blue site was the site that had the most settlement. And then the Tutamata and then this one. So something is, there is some more of whatever the gusto is growing on the undersides of the offshore plates than on the other sides. Um, when you start looking at the percent composition of the different organisms on it, though, it doesn't make any sense. You can't really figure out what component of the community structure um, between the two of them, uh, between the three sites, made any difference. So we designed and yet another experiment because we have a statistical problem of having enough substrate at the different sides. So we went out with little cubes. Um, so we would have equal amounts of surface, you know, surface side and bottom. And we have all these different treatments. We had controls that were just sitting there in the open. We had cage ones to prevent grazers from condition, uh, changing the position, we had cage control, shade, and shade control. Um, and the idea was that if, if some aspect of light or grazing determined why the undersides would be better attractive to the larvae, that by shading and or caging or combination of the two, we could make the tops be as attractive to the larvae as the bottoms. Well, that was in theory. Here's what the racks look like. We had 16 of these things all over the place. And they still preferred the bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> For all the different treatments, didn't make any difference. Uh, and here's tops versus bottom of all treatments lumped together. Um, here's the tops, the sides, and the bottoms of all treatments put together. And uh, here's the bottom saw for all the different treatments. So. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but there is definitely something that ecologically is causing a community structure to form that is more attractive to coral larvae, and it's not exactly where we would expect it to be. So uh, I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time. So then I moved to looking at settlement, uh, I mean survivorship. So we took all these tiles after mapping them all, put them back on their pins out on the reef, waited a month or two, brought them back into the lab, looked at them all again to see how many of the spat that we could identify initially were still around. And not very good. Um, this is the numbers of settlers, but we started out with, um, and again, uh, these two are the bottoms at two different sites. This is from the Florida Keys, these are the tops. So we didn't have very many on the tops to begin with. And you know, by the end of, of a few months, you just don't have very much left. We got a little bit uh, higher survivorship for, for our crop row, but um, present survivorship really was, was pretty low. Um, the brooders, we had much higher survivorship. Um, so the problem is, is that, and here's a later experiment we did with uh, three different sites, a lot more plates this time. Um, and you can see that, again, survivorship was pretty low. And then about after nine months, we couldn't find anything on our plates. 
So the problem with trying to do longer term survivorship is that you have to have so many plates and so many learning on them that you, you have nothing to measure. No reason to go back out yet. So I mean, this is probably not unexpected. We're only looking at a few thousand larvae. These, these animals spawn millions of eggs, you know, tens of millions of eggs in any one season. So we didn't have very many individuals to follow in terms of statistically dealing with at the population level. But this is also a period of time where people are putting out settlement plates and looking at natural recruitment and not finding a lot of recruits. So these animals don't recruit very easily or very often. Um, same thing with the, those uh, plates that I had all intermingled in Puerto Rico. Um, we had, um, here, interesting, remember they had the greatest settlement at the buoy initially, but we had the lowest survivorship at the buoy and we had the most survivorship um, on the tops and the bottoms of the more in, inshore, really turbid site. It was a terrible site to work. Gorgonians and mud and all kinds of things, but coral survived better there for whatever reason. Um, I'm just pulling this up from a really old paper, uh, Miller, Well and Schmott 99, um, where we surveyed reefs of the Florida Keys and we looked at um, inshore, um, so the, these uh, green boxes are for inshore reefs and the two uh, white boxes are for orange shore reefs, and we looked at size classes. You know, and when you look at the offshore reefs, the reefs that have names and are people are going diving, all that kind of stuff, we had, uh, this was all done in Biscay National Park, I guess, so a little bit further north than the Florida Keys. Um, but you don't have very many big corals out there. You know, you, you have lots of little recruits, but they just don't survive very long. And you go to the patch reefs, which are messy, and gorgonians, and sponges, and detritus, and that's where you have more size class, so more of the recruits are actually surviving. So some of these inshore sites, even though they're more environmentally deteriorated from our point of view, may be better places for, for corals to, to succeed. And other studies have shown similar things like that. So this is an unpublished study that I want to bring to your attention very quickly here that we discovered is one of these serendipity things. And in terms of looking at these pulse sediment survivorship, one day in a six well plate, I, I start seeing these weird looking coral larvae and also I had a student who had mapped all these coral plates and I go look at them two days later and there wasn't a coral settler on them. I'm like what happened what were you measuring there's no coral on here um, and then what we discovered were these little balls here are actually some form of ciliate which um, in collaboration with Diana Lip, Lip, Lipkin at uh, George Mason University. She thinks they're a new, possibly even a new order of ciliate. Um, and this is something we really need to get out. We just, it's been lingering. Um, this probably is not gonna work either, which is really hurts, because this, this video is amazing to watch these things. Um, I don't know why the video, are, oh, it is working. So these things are pack predators. They, they have no color until they suck up the juices from from the coral larvae. And because Fabia has so many fluorescent proteins, see the brown, that's zozanthelli, and the green is the green fluorescent protein that the ciliates are picking up. Um, here's a longer video that I put together. So they just, after they feed and they gorge, then they just sit there and like go to sleep. This is a plastic six well place. So, you know, you can see these things there, but if you poke them, they come to life again. <laughs> and then they go around and you can see this, this happy poke. You can see they extend this like, uh-oh, they extend this proboscis. Um, and then they just suck in. They have this weird structure. That's why they think it's a new order because they've not seen them in any other cilia group. Um, and they just sit there and they suck up the juices. Um, and then they swim around. And then when they're full, they just go and sit around on, on, a, on a, there's a settlement plate coming up now. Once they go, if you had real stuff growing there, you can't see them. If we hadn't looked at these with a fluorescent microscope and they hadn't been feeding on a really fluorescent tissue, we would never have discovered them. So that's why I'm saying these are serendipity. They look like little barrels. This is what's left of a polyp, whoops, I guess every time I use this, it stops it. Um, there's a bit of skeleton there and not much tissue left. They, they consume these things down to nothing. I found them on a crop of palmata, on, um, on tastria. They eat fabia. They eat, um, that, which is where we first found them, corides. 
this is what happens if you don't have the fluorescent microscope. You know, you see some ciliates moving around down there. I'm going to put one back to life here. Right up, baby. And they're all over the place in there. And we did all, and down in Curacao, I thought it was a, it was one of these weird things I found in Puerto Rico. And then six months later, I go down to Curacao and they show up again. It's like, oh my God, it's for real. Um, it wasn't just an artifact in the sea water system in the Gaius. Um, so this is something that may be having a tremendous impact on coral recruitment. Um, these predators that are just dormant there, um, I, they may specialize on things like Fabia because Fabia is very reproducible and they may be able to go dormant for a month of time. Um, so very quickly to end up here, while all of this is going on and I'm worrying about corals and coral reproduction, um, what's happening in the world? Temperatures are going up. We're starting to get bleaching events. This is a slide from Ernesto Whale in Puerto Rico. Here's coral declining. Here's algae going up. Here's temperature going up. And so, um, like any good scientist, watching bleaching happening around, this is where the, the offshore plates were, were uh, you know, went from looking like this to like this, and then the corals mostly died here. Um, so, uh, the work that I did with a graduate student, Carly Randall, for her master's thesis, we started collecting these um, embryos and then raising them at different temperatures. And you can see what the warm summer temperatures. Remember, most of these Caribbean corals are spawning during the hottest months of the year. Their spawning is August, September. These are bleaching months. Usually we get wonderful spawn and then the next week the corals would bleach. Um, and then uh, this was done, we did a lot of this work in 2008, but in 2000, we were doing some stuff in 2005 Terrible bleaching year in Puerto Rico, 2006, no spawning, 2007, no spawning, 2008, they spawned, Montasha spawned eggs that hardly developed. We could not get them to settle, so they were deficient eggs, probably not enough lipid in them. Um, and uh, what, what Carly found on her experiments is that at elevated temperatures, they just, uh, you get really high mortality of, of the, um, these, are, these are actually ambient temperatures that we were measuring in Puerto Rico. And settlement goes way down too. The ones that do survive don't settle. And by looking at all the stages of embryogenesis, we're able to detect that the most sensitive period for, for temperature on uh, coral development is during the gastrulation process, which is a very complicated process for them to go through all this invagination process and things like that. And apparently they just make a lot of mistakes and they don't, they don't survive it. So um, then the next bandwagon that came along was ocean acidification. And um, so, of course, we got to look at that, too. Um, and um, however, I will start out by saying that, yes, the oceans are acidifying slightly. Um, they're still pretty alkaline. Um, and the kind of levels of acidification that people are using experimentally to show effects on corals are pretty extreme. They're talking about the year 2100, 2200, things like that. My, my philosophy is that by the time the oceans get that acidic, there aren't going to be any corals left because the temperature is going to kill them. But that's just me. Um, so anyway, but we did study it, and um, so this is a, a very highly cited paper, a fellow uh, former graduate student, Chris Jury, Rob Whitehead, and, and me, and um, we had all these different treatments, and, and Chris did really careful studies. The bottom line here is that um, if you have normal pH and normal carbonate, this is sort of like the calcification rates you have, um, if you have normal pH, so same normal pH of 8.2, but you have low carbonate and very low carbonate, you have the depressed calcification rates. If you have really low pH, but you elevate the carbonate, then you have um, really nice high pH uh, calcification. And if you have low pH and low bicarbonate, but high bicarbonate, then you, then you have normal calcification rate. So it seems to be bicarbonate, which is driving the calcification reaction, and that has all to do with internal physiology of the corals. Um, and uh, so here's a plot of bicarbonate against calcification rates, and you can see that, um, and this includes all different pHs. If you have different pHs, it really depends on what bicarbonate you have in there. Um, so I think people need to rethink a little bit the, the physiology behind coral calcification. People are doing that now. This paper is now, what, nine years old? Um, so people are realizing that it's not so, so simple as just saying, Saturation state is, explains everything to do with ocean acidification and um, 
Coral Calcification. And to end here, I have um, Colleen did her honors thesis in my lab and following up on this, she had the patience of a saint to stick microelectrodes in the gastrovascular cavities of individual polyps. And um, here's, a, here's an oxygen microelectrode showing uh, in, in the light, oxygen is high, and in the dark, it goes down. Actually, it goes down to like zero at times. It's amazing. And then you turn on the light, and it comes back up. I don't know what happened to the light dark bars there. They disappeared in the translation. But anyway, so uh, respiration photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis, respiration, photosynthesis, respiration. So the internal milieu of the coral is determined by what the coral tissue is doing, not by the outside water, which was at 100% saturation the whole time. Um, when you look at what the pH inside the gastrovascular cavity is, now this is with the pH electrode in here, um, very similar experiment, light, photosynthesis, respiration, photosynthesis, respiration, photosynthesis, um, and this is for two different species. Um, this is, so these three curves, this is at ambient outside pH 8.2, our control. This is at 7.9, this is 7.5. For cavernosa, there's no difference. The animal is driving the cart, not the external seawater. Okay, so the, this tissue and the photosynthesis inside the tissue is what's driving um, the internal pH of the animal. There's uh, this other species from the Pacific did show more of an effect of the ambient seawater when the ambient seawater pH was decreased than the gastrovascular um, pH decreased. And this is very complicated here to, to look at. I, I, I suggest you invite Colleen to talk to you about her, her project. I just want to, um, three little quick bullets here that she worked with two different species and the two different species reacted very differently under the same experiments. Cavernosa was pretty immune to changes in external pH within the range that we studied um, and the durations of exposure while this, uh, Duncanophilia axifuga um, showed more sensitivity. Um, the calcification rates themselves of the cavernosa uh, for all these different pHs uh, was, was, was independent of the external pH and uh, in the internal pH, we only measured in the light, the internal pH was always high in the light. No matter what you did to, on the outside, it was still high on the inside. Um, for uh, Duchanophilia, there was a, a regression, a significant relationship with, um, but, but a lot of scatter um, between the external P, the gastrovascular pH and the calcification rate. And you can see that in this animal, which has really large polyps, gastrovascular pH was more affected by what the ambient seawater was. So you're gonna, again, you can't generalize. Corals are not all the same. They have different structures, different physiologies. And that's what it is. And so just to, to really, really end, because I'm running out of time, um, my last thing that I've been working on, and I showed a number of you guys today, our instrument, Kiss Me. Um, so I wish I'd had this 20 years ago. Um, the technology wasn't there for us to develop it. But now we have a, a diver deployed underwater respirometer that we can measure in situ on the reef on live corals without chunking them up. We can measure rates of respiration, photosynthesis, um, and calcification. Uh, we've used it on corals mostly because that's what it was designed for. But, um, but it can, we have tried it on crustless corallins and macroalgae and salmon plates. Um, we have these available for collaborative use where you guys test them, tell us what you like them, you can use them, get data. I have at least one of your students, John, who said that she's interested. <laughs> so <laughs> just gotta work out a deal here. We call it Kiss Me for Coral in Situ Metabolism. And um, some of the things that we can do with it. So here's a couple graphs. Uh, PI curves generated with um, a PAM fluorometer, or the green ones, and the Kiss Me or the red. Um, so we get very similar curves until we get to the higher levels. It's well known that at higher light levels, the relationship between oxygen, you know, the carbon flow and the the, the trans, electron transport rate stopped being correlative. So we can show that. Um, kind of things we can obviously measure respiration, photosynthesis, kind of things that you can't measure easily in situ. Here's the P to R ratios of corals in situ for four different months of the year in Puerto Rico. Um, here's RQs and PQs. We can 
calculate um, respiration photosynthesis both based on carbon dioxide, both on carbon and oxygen basis. So from that we can do RQs and PQs, which tell you about metabolic substrates. So this is some real physiology that you can do in situ. And there's so many questions that can be addressed with this. Everything from monitoring post-hurricane stress, um, you know, looking at effects of nutrition on, on, on these kind of uh, physiological parameters and things like that. So I'm hoping that you guys uh, will um, join the club and try to use this thing. Um, and to end in a sad note, so this is what I'm talking, this is the kind of thing that makes me depressed. This is a place in Curacao that I nicknamed Montastra Heaven when I first went there in 2007. I actually heard about it in 2000, yeah, I think 2007 was the first time I went there, or 2009. And it was like, I've never seen so much Montastra in one place since I started diving, right? I mean, have you ever seen anything like that? Okay. Now, here comes the depressing part. That's what it looks like now. One good bleaching year. This was at the northern tip of the island of Curacao. It was up, there was a lot of current. And then in 2010, November, a big bleaching event came through and it died. And you know, when you talk to the local dive shops, there's dive shops all over the place say, oh, but the coral's all brown, the coral's all coming back. And I said, it's not, <laughs> it's dead. What you got there, the brown is algae. And we had seen some other reefs that looked like this that were a little bit further away, must have gotten bleached sometime when people weren't. There was a place called Mushroom Forest that sort of looks like this. Everybody goes diving there. And, uh, and it was, you know, I was like, eh, this is not so good. But Guanmula was amazing. I mean, this is amazing. And this is sad. And I, in 2008 at the, at the coral reef meeting, I kept saying, there's this place that needs to be protected. Somebody needs to buy up this, this land there and protect these reefs. But I was like, well, no, you know, it's in another country, whatever. And now it's gone. So the rapid whirlwind that I showed you is a product of lots and lots of people. I especially want to thank Margaret Miller and Ernesto Whale. Um, lots of help during the summers with all of these settlement plates and, and spawn collection and things like that. So I, I apologize. I didn't leave much time for Ernest, but I guess there is a happy hour. And I will be around for a little while. And, be happy to answer any questions, or if anybody wants to see anything in more detail, be happy to talk with them. So. Thank you. Um, as she mentioned, we are going to talk a little after this briefly for like uh, drinks of alcoholic and non-alcoholic. So don't worry if we can't partake. Um, I think there's a class coming in here at five. Um, I know I have a question from the coast, but. I can relay the answer. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely can talk to you. Okay, so. Well, I can close the door. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so good to see some more. Thank you. 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 Thank
I've never seen anybody. Thank you so much for switching. I don't It's kind of cool, but it's not that cool. Right, but it's not a No, we don't. Yeah, and we won't be using that one. Oh, okay. Thank you. 